Today we talked to political activist Mike McCabe, who's running in the Democratic primary. Mike McCabe, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, we're starting everybody off with their elevator pitch. You have the length of an elevator ride to tell someone why you're running for governor of Wisconsin. What do you tell them? I'm running because we've got a government that works exceptionally well for a wealthy and well-connected few at the very top, but has left an awful lot of people behind. And, you know, I've traveled 90,000 miles now during this campaign all across Wisconsin, and I find an awful lot of forgotten people living in forgotten places, some in the inner city, some way out in the country, like where I'm from. But the, but they don't feel like their voices are being heard and their interests are certainly not being represented. And I think that has a lot to do with the influence of, of big money in politics. And, of course, my life's work has been about exposing the cronyism and corruption and what amounts to legal bribery that has taken root in our political system. We've got to uproot it. Uh, that, that has been the work I've done for much of my adult life. I take that that mission into the governor's race and hopefully into the governor's office itself. Now, how, can you talk more about your experience with uh, the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign and your group Blue Jean Nation and mm-hmm. uh, how that prepares you to be governor? Yeah, you know, I, I um, started a group called the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign and led it as its director for 15 years. And, and that group was, was devoted first and foremost to following the money and helping to expose the transactions between wealthy donors and elected officials and then connect the dots between those transactions and decisions that government makes. And one of the things I, I've i learned after all those years of following the money is that one half of 1% of the American population supplies more than two-thirds of all the political money. And what those wealthy donors want our government to do is really different than what the rest of the population wants our, our government to do. And they get their way on so many issues that affect every issue that we care about. And and that's what's got to change. We've we've got to challenge and overcome that money power, and I think we do it with with people power, with grassroots organization. So that's the kind of campaign that 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 I was committed to running from the start was is one that was truly grassroots and truly people powered in nature, and and relied on on the volunteer energy of thousands of people across the state rather than simply chasing fat cat donors from coast to coast and 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 trying to raise the most money. When you were debating whether to run for governor, you weighed running as an, possibly an independent or a Democrat at the UW-Milwaukee-sponsored debate uh, last month. You wouldn't pledge to support whoever the Democratic winner is coming out of the primary if, it's, if it isn't you. So for Democrats looking to vote in a Democratic primary, does that give them pause? Do you worry that uh, they might uh, be dissuaded from supporting you for those reasons? Well, y- you know what? I haven't belonged to a political party of any kind uh, over the course of my life, and I did work as an independent watchdog that put me in a position of calling out Democrats and Republicans when I saw wrongdoing or unethical behavior, and, and I make no apologies for, the, for that work. I'm proud of it. Um, and now that I'm running for governor, for me, it, it, it's pretty simple. I just think it's a mistake to make party loyalty pledges. Uh, to, to say that whoever the nominee is, just because they've got a D behind their name, that's the person you'll support, I think is immensely disrespectful to the voters out there. Uh, it, what it says to the voters is that is that uh, party is more important than anything. Party comes before the people. Car- party comes before country. And that's just a horrible message to send to the voters of, of this state. Uh, they, they're fed up with with the you know the cancerous partisanship and the fact that Democrats and Republicans can't talk to each other, much less work things out with each other, and and when they hear politicians say that that party comes before everything, that that's a huge turnoff. And what I can tell you is I won't vote for Scott Walker. That that's the one thing that's sure. We need a new governor, and I'm committed to getting Wisconsin a new governor. So uh, somebody with my values and my desire to to see Wisconsin have a new direction. I I can't vote for Scott Walker, but I th- I just think it's a mistake to make a party loyalty pledge and say it doesn't matter who the person is as long as they've got a D behind the name. Talking to Mike McCabe about his campaign in the Democratic primary for governor. Uh, governor Walker is making the case that uh, the state doesn't need a change of governor. Things are working. Unemployment is low. Uh, businesses are, are having a hard time finding people to fill jobs. Uh, so things are going well. Why should voters want to change? Yeah, he talks a lot about the low unemployment rate. Uh, and I and I would say, hey, look, people can find work out there. But I saw a recent report that said if you're a minimum wage worker, you need three jobs to afford housing in the state. And there's so many people out there who are working two or three jobs and they can't keep their heads above water. Wisconsin so far in the 21st century has seen its middle class shrink more than any state in America. And we now have levels of economic inequality in our state not not seen since the Great Depression. And we're dead last in the nation in new business startups for the last three straight years. 
So, yeah, people can find work out there. In fact, they've often collected two or three jobs, but they still can't keep themselves in the middle class. That's what's got to change. We've got to, instead of feeding the rich, instead of showering tax breaks and state subsidies on a few at the very top and hope that they work magic for the rest of us, we've got to use our state's resources to empower regular working people from the ground up. And and that means a living wage for every worker, health care for all, debt-free education for our young people, bring high-speed Internet everywhere to every part of the state. Those are the tools that regular people need to be to, to be able to do more for themselves and for each other. Yeah, what would your top uh, priorities be if you were elected governor on day one aimed at uh, boosting wages in Wisconsin? I, I am committed to, to seeing a, a substantial increase in the minimum wage. Uh, up to $15 an hour phased in over five years, and then adjust that wage for inflation going forward after that. Uh, make it a true living wage. Uh, and and uh, and then the other thing is I think we've got to get rid of the wage suppression policies that have been put in place. And, and uh, you know, one of them, for example, is, is often called right to work. And I, I, I'm sorry, I refuse to call it right to work. Workers had the right to work before. What this is is a wage suppression policy. This is about is about keeping wages low, and and to me that's a killer for our economy. W- low wages are a killer for the economy. They suppress demand and they inhibit sales. The way to create a sturdy economy is to put more money in the pockets of regular working people, because when they get more money in their pockets, they don't do what a lot of rich people do. They don't stash it in a tax haven in Bermuda or the Cayman Islands. They they don't just pad their net worth with it. They don't take it out of circulation. They spend it. And when they spend it, somebody's got to sell what they want to buy. And that stimulates business. That creates economic prosperity. The argument from business groups uh, is, hey, if you raise the minimum wage, uh, you restore union rules, that's in- that increases the cost for us to do business that's going to make us less likely to hire people. We're going to hire fewer people. Now, and, and that's never happened over the course of our country's history for as long as we've had a minimum wage. The federal minimum wage has been raised more than 20 times. And and never once during all those years when the minimum wage was increased did the number of jobs uh, decline or disappear. Uh, never once did the economy shrink. The economy grew through more than 20 increases in the minimum wage and employment overall numbers of jobs grew over the course of more than 20 increases in the minimum wage. So despite that propaganda, the reality sh- paints a very different picture. And again, it's it's about making an about face, a total 180-degree turn in the way we think about building a sturdy economy. We can either feed the rich, we can depend on trickle-down economics, or we can embrace what I, I like to call geyser economics. I, I, I just think that you got to accept that economic prosperity doesn't trickle down. It gushes up. And, and we've got to put more money in the pockets of regular working people. We've got to empower them with, with other investments like health care for all and education opportunity that, that they can get debt free without they, they we ought to have a, a, a state where you can work your way through school and come out without a without being buried under a mountain of debt and bring high speed internet to every nook and cranny of the state do those things and 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 rebuild our infrastructure where we can have a, a much healthier economy we don't have to be leading the nation in shrinkage of the middle class staying with the economy for a moment uh, we've got this foxconn deal ground has been broken a state investment Investment here. What's your view on that? What would you do as governor? I think it's an example of, of the very kind of approach that has failed us for decades and will continue to fail us. I, I just don't think crony capitalism and and corporate welfare is the way to build a, a sturdy economy. And, and it's another example of showering tax breaks and state subsidies on a few. There's the old saying, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And here Wisconsin is putting all of its eggs, four and a half billion dollars worth of eggs in one basket uh, with the hope that, that this one company that subsidizing the global expansion of a Taiwanese conglomerate is going to work magic for Wisconsin. It's a strategy that has failed us for years. I think it'll keep right on failing us. I I think we have to do that about face. We have to change our philosophy of economic development. You take the state of Minnesota. Minnesota raised taxes on the rich, increased spending for education, and raised wages by increasing the minimum wage. We did the opposite in Wisconsin. Cut taxes for the rich, cut education spending, kept wages as low as federal law allows. Minnesota surged ahead of Wisconsin by just about every measure of economic activity.
But as governor, do you cancel the Foxconn deal or try to? Uh, I would I would love to get Wisconsin taxpayers off the hook for four and a half billion dollars worth of corporate welfare payments. And and I, I don't think this is the right approach, the right strategy. And I, I would absolutely insist on renegotiation of terms. We've got a signed agreement. And I and I don't think I think it's an over promise to simply say that Wisconsin can cancel that that contract without being then sued for breach of contract. If somebody's going to breach this contract, it should be Foxconn, and and it should be the state of Wisconsin on behalf of our taxpayers who say you've breached the contract and and we're going to cancel it. But we're going to there's going to be opportunities to continue to look at this over the course of of years. Talking to political activist Mike McCabe right now, he's a Democratic candidate in the primary race for governor, and you can join in at eight hundred six four two one two three four. What question do you have? For the candidate, do you want to know where he stands on a particular issue? Call now at 800-642-1234. That's 800-642-1234. Or email ideas at WPR.org. Mike McCabe is with us. We're talking about his campaign in the Democratic primary for governor of Wisconsin. And you can join in at 800-642-1234. What questions do you have for Mike McCabe? What issues do you want him to weigh in on? Call 800-642-1234 or email ideas at WPR.org. To your calls, Brad is with us in Milwaukee. Brad, hi. How you doing? Uh, good. What did you want to ask about, Brad? Um, okay. Uh, when did when did companies and, and, and politics in general just lose sight of the fact that it's the middle class and below that who actually pay for these companies to, to, to have these products? I mean, if I'm rich... And I've already got thirty million dollars in the bank account, but you're going to over here. Your government over here is going to give me a tax break of another million. I'm not going to spend that million. I'm not going to put it into the economy. I'm not going to go to Walmart. I'm not going to go to Menards. I'm not going to go to local mom and pa shops. So when did when did that idea change that the middle class is what actually keeps America going and businesses going, and instead it became you know what rich people need more. Brad, gotcha, uh, Mike. Yeah, Henry Ford was one of the most legendary businessmen in American history, and. And he famously said, I, I, I want to pay workers enough so that they can afford to buy a Ford. He understood that, that he depended on, on regular working people to be able to buy his cars. If he was going to sell many cars, he, he couldn't just sell them to, rich, to his rich friends. He, he needed a middle class that could support that business. That was an enlightened uh, attitude about, about the connection between, between uh, uh, a company and the community. That has been weakened and, and in some extent is disappearing from the landscape. That has to be brought back. Uh, we've got to have a middle class if we're going to have a, a healthy economy. Back to your calls. Mary is on the line in Brookfield. Mary, hi. Hi, and hi to Mike McCabe. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Um, hi. Mike, my question is this. All of the Democratic challengers who were in the race up to whatever point all indicated that they would you know, we're, we're somewhat profound about, you know, we're going to reverse Act 10. We're going to get rid of Act 10. And I don't know that that's so easily done, considering the many layers to Act 10. Could you maybe help me out with that? Well, Act 10, of course, uh, took away public sector employees' uh, collective bargaining rights, their ability to, to unionize and, and bargain as a, as a group with with uh, government employers, uh, and that law was, Act 10 was a law that was made. It can be unmade. It can be repealed. I actually think it's not a sustainable policy for Wisconsin because you take schools, for example, uh, because of Act 10, I, I think it's a big factor. Uh, we've now got more and more veteran teachers fleeing the profession. They are demoralized. They're discouraged. They feel devalued, and they are leaving the profession early, and yet we've got fewer and fewer young people wanting to enter the teaching profession by going into teacher training. And that's a recipe for disaster over the long haul. And we've got small rural school systems out there that I've talked to that have job openings and no applicants. Now, how are you going to run a school system if you've got job openings and nobody applying for those jobs? And and so that's a serious problem that we've got to address. I do favor repealing Act 10, but what I, I am committed to is doing it as part of a package that helps all working people in every, every sector of the economy. We can't, we can't simply single out one group of workers and say we're going to help them and then have other groups of working people resent those, those few who get some help. We've got to do this in a way that helps all working people in every sector of the economy so that, that working people can't be pitted against each other and divided and conquered. 
Thanks for the call. We'll go next to Mark on the line in Richland Center. Mark, hello. Hi, Mike. I, uh, this, this whole tr- um, budget process that we're in, the largest or one of the largest expenses in our budget is debt service because we borrow from a bank that we don't own. Could you speak to the idea that we, the people, should own the bank so that when we borrow money, we borrow from ourselves, and then we pay ourselves back and put that interest right back into our own budget like they do in South Dakota, or North Dakota, rather? A public-owned state uh, bank, I guess he's talking about. Yeah, and, and there it is North Dakota. There is a state bank of North Dakota. And actually, long before I ever became a candidate for governor, I, I did a lot of writing and speaking about, about how a state bank uh, like the state bank in North Dakota would make a lot of sense for Wisconsin to keep our capital in our state and to keep our capital working for people in Wisconsin. It, it's an idea that, that should be explored by our state. But when you talk about state transportation policy is a great example of where uh where we're we've based our transportation policy on the worst two options imaginable neglect of basic upkeep to the point where we now have some of the worst roads in the country and then heavy reliance on borrowing to the extent that we are spending on roads and uh it, that's just flat out irresponsible 24 24 cents out of every dollar that we spend that we pay in gas tax now it doesn't go to pave anything it goes for debt repayment so we're putting all this on a credit card rather than paying as we pave and that's got to change but you know i i think the the debate over a, a state bank like north dakota has they've used it for example for for student debt refinancing to put to to have capital in their state that can be used to help students get out from underneath the burden of of crushing student debt. Uh, We don't have such an approach here in Wisconsin, and so we've got the average student coming out with $30,000 in debt. I met a young woman not too long ago who had $150,000 in accumulated student debt. When is she ever going to put a down payment on a home? When is she going to be able to buy a car? And what does that do to the home builders and the realtors and the automakers and the car dealers when an entire generation isn't able to participate in the economy that way and make those purchases? It hurts our whole economy. And North Dakota has used its state bank to to find to be able to enable people to to do student debt refinancing and get out from underneath that crushing debt. So it's a model that I think we ought to look at in Wisconsin. Talking to Mike McCabe about his campaign in the Democratic primary for governor. Back to your calls. Eloise is on the line in Watoma. Eloise, hi. Hi. Uh, I haven't heard any of our Democrats running for governor talk about automatic weapons sales in Wisconsin and gun control here. I know we haven't had any schools shot up, but thank God for that. Uh, Eloise asking about guns and gun control issues, Mike. Yeah, I grew up in, on a farm, and that means I came from hunting country, and I, I've hunted myself. But I'll tell you, you don't need a bump stock to turn a regular gun into a machine gun to go hunting. You don't need a 30-round clip. You don't need 30-round magazine to go hunting. You, you, you get the one shot at the deer, you miss, the deer's gone. You don't need 30 shots. So I've actually come out in favor of 16 different steps, uh, comprehensive criminal background checks, and restore the 48-hour waiting period for for uh, gun purchases, uh, I do. I I do support banning military assault weapon sales, uh, ban bump stacks. You don't need machine gun to go hunting. None of the steps I've taken, 16 different sta- steps to address gun violence and make schools and communities safer and save lives, would require us to repeal the Second Amendment or stop people from hunting or stop law-abiding people from owning guns. But it would, it would address the underlying problems that lead to these mass eruptions of violence. And we can take these steps. But it does require being willing and able to stand up to, to the gun manufacturing lobby, the NRA. And they, they oppose every one of these 16 steps that I've come out in favor of. So uh, I, I tell you, we're not going to get anything more than thoughts and prayers after each new mass shooting as, as long as elected officials are paid to take no other action. Standing up to that very powerful lobby is central to being able to get to, a, to, to the point where some common sense decisions can be made that respects hunting and respects the Second Amendment, but deals with these underlying causes of mass shootings. Thanks for the call. Time for, I think, one more caller. Dayton is on the line in La Crosse. Dayton, hello. Hi. um, I work in the trades, and I went to a trade school here in La Crosse. Uh, I just wanted to hear um, Mr. McCabe's thoughts on promoting the trades and promoting trade schools in Wisconsin. All for it. And, and I think that, 
you know, a four-year university is not for everybody. It's, uh, I think for some people, a, a, an apprentice program or a two-year program that, that gets them the skills that they need to go out in the workplace is, is what they need. Uh, we need to invest in education for all, of, uh, for all of that. But I'll tell you this. For those who are trying to turn four-year universities into glorified trade schools by eliminating the arts and humanities, I think that's a mistake, too. I, I think our best protection uh, from, the, from employment being automated out of existence by robots and by driverless vehicles that are coming is the ability to think critically and creatively and strategically to be able to think and and that that is is something that is very much nurtured by arts and humanities education so i think there's an important place for that too and i so as much as i'm devoted to creating good train job training opportunities debt free job training for everyone so that they get the skills they need to be employable as committed as i am to that and the and the two year vocational technical colleges and making making those investments i'm equally committed to preserving arts and ed- and humanities education in those four years u- universities We'll leave it there for now. Mike McCabe, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Mike McCabe is running for governor in the Democratic primary.